The message that I would like to share with you today is in many ways my own personal testimony. I became a Seventh-day Adventist in 1997 after attending a series of meetings on the book of Revelation. I've been trying to study that book on my own, but I was new to the Bible and Bible study, so it was very difficult for me to understand the symbols and the language that was employed in that particular book. But I got this invitation in the mail to attend a Revelation seminar, and I was so excited. I started attending the meetings, and the Lord was blessing and, and opening my eyes to see so many precious truths in His Word. There was a real burn in my heart and a thirst for His Word. It was a very special time in my life. When the meetings were over, I knew that this was the truth, and I made my decision to be baptized and join the church. So I started out on my Christian journey, and things were going pretty good for about five or six years. But as time went on, I knew something was wrong. Something was desperately missing. I didn't have an anchor that would keep me in trial and temptation. I didn't know how to trust God and claim His promises and rest in His loving care. I always thought God was angry at me and that His frown was upon me. I got very discouraged. As time went on, the discouragement turned to despair and despondency and depression, and it was so dark. My past started haunting me, and I felt like God was so far from me and that I was suffering His wrath because of all the bad choices I, that I had made in my life. The enemy was truly torturing my soul, and I felt so lost. In this state of mind, I often didn't want to live, and many times I really wanted to take my own life because I just couldn't bear it anymore. It was, it was so miserable. Looking back on all of that, I truly praise God for keeping me and bringing me through it. It's only by His grace, and I realized that. I started to realize that I really had not embraced Christ as my personal Savior. I had embraced the, the doctrines or the teachings of the church, but I had not been led to give my life to Christ and, and understand what baptism really meant that I was you know, dying to self and rising up to a new life in Christ. And I didn't, you know, through all that darkness and despair, I didn't know how to trust Him. I did not have a personal walk with Him to see me through it. But the Lord has recently started to open my eyes to see the truth of who my Savior is and that He truly does love me and He has the power to save me. He's teaching me how to trust in His Word and His Word alone. And I just pray that as I share this message with you today, that if you're in a similar situation or you're struggling uh, with something similar to what I've gone through, I'm, I'm asking God to really pour out a blessing upon you and help you to understand that we can truly trust God in His power to save us through His Word. It's all through His Word. And so before we open, I would like to have a word of prayer. Precious Father, we just humbly bow before your throne of grace and ask, Lord, that you would pour out a special blessing upon us. Father, your word says that when, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and show you things to come. So we want to claim this promise by faith, trusting that your spirit will be with us to guide us and teach us, Father. I pray that if there is some soul out there whose heart is longing for a deeper living experience with you, that you would reveal yourself to them. I pray that you would bind up all their wounds and heal them through your word. We ask, Lord, that you would send your spirit to, to fill each heart and, and that our eyes would be open to see the things that you're trying to show us in your word today. I also pray, Lord, that you would empty me of self that you would fill me with your sweet spirit and that you'd put your words in my mouth, Lord, because I'm, I'm just a child. I don't know how to go out or come in. I don't know, Father, what to say, but I know that you know what to say. And I just pray that you will use me and that it will be a blessing. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The title of our message today is The Power of Forgiveness. Let us turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. The word also declares that in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. We are carnal, sold under sin, and that we are all, we're all filled with all unrighteousness. This surely pictures a very desperate condition, doesn't it? Fallen humanity in a deplorable condition, unprofitable, serving no purpose. There is no hope of anyone lifting himself up by his bootstraps and doing better. But in this same word, we find the good, glad news that God has provided a way by which we may be cleansed from our unrighteousness and be clothed and filled with his perfect righteousness. Only our infinite, all-wise, and compassionate Father could and would provide such a solution. So let us praise God that there is hope for humanity. Let's go to Psalm 130, verses 1 to 2. And it says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. In the depths of sin, if we cry out to the Lord, our cry will not be in vain. What hope does the Lord hold out for us? Let's read verses 3 to 8. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So out of the depths of iniquity we may cry to the Lord with the assurance that he will gladly help us. We cannot be too low down for him to reach us. And be sure, be assured, God is not looking for faults in us, nor harshly reproving us when he sees them. But he graciously forgives them. And it is this tenderness that leads us to fear him. The true fear of God is to, give, is to fear to grieve his tender heart of love. There is a saying that God helps those who help themselves. But the truth revealed in the Bible is that God helps the man who's not able to help himself. God helps those who give up on helping themselves. Is your soul in distress or bondage today because of some kind of trouble? Some sin or physical or emotional pain in your life? Are you at your wit's end and know not what to do? Old friends, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. He's equal to, eager to come to your aid and deliver you out of all your distresses. Let us see how eager he is to come to our aid. Turn to Psalm 107, verses 23 to, 20, 23 to 27. Psalm 107, 23 to 30, actually. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then they, then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. In verse 27, where it reads, they are at their wit's end, the marginal reading means that all their wisdom is swallowed up. So if your wisdom is swallowed up, what are you? If you have no wisdom, you're a fool. So these are fools that are trying to save themselves. And it is only when our wisdom is swallowed up that we realize our utter helplessness. In all our helplessness, it is the Lord who helps and delivers, not we ourselves. 
Let's go to Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. And it says, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Infirm means without strength. Without strength implies being overcome by sin. So in the midst of defeat, when borne down under sin, we may come with boldness to Jesus and find forgiveness and help. For it is only at the very lowest possible state that we become connected with Christ. So in this lowest state, in all our unrighteousness and helplessness, what did Christ do? Turn to Romans chapter 3, 21 to 26. And it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So the scriptures tell us that Christ came to give us righteousness. What does he declare or speak his righteousness for? Verse 25 says, for the remission of sins. And how does he give us this righteousness? Verse 26 says, 26 says he declares it. And how long does this process take? Verse 26 says, at this time. God is saying, that, it, that at the very moment the sinner acknowledges his lost condition and believes and receives the word into his heart by faith, it's at this time that he receives the righteousness. When God speaks something, we can depend wholly upon that word to do just what it says. It is by faith. Feeling has nothing to do with it. Psalm 130 verse 5 says, In his word do I hope. It doesn't say in, his, in our feelings do we hope, but in his word do I hope. What word spoken or declared by the Lord gives sinners tremendous hope? Let's read 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what is the meaning of the word forgive? Forgive is made up of two words, for and give. To better understand this word better, let's first look at some other words. If you are cheerful, then you're full of cheer. If you're faithful, you're full of faith. If you're joyful, you're full of joy. If you're careful, you're full of care. To forgive is to give for. When sins are forgiven, something is given for them. What is it that is given for them? Let's read Galatians 1.4. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Friends, Christ gave himself for us. He gave his pure, spotless, righteous life for our life of sin. When we ask God to forgive us, he gives for those sins his righteousness. So God has set forth Christ to declare or speak his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. When the sinner believes that Christ is his personal Savior, 
then according to his unfailing promises, God pardons his sin and justifies him freely. The repentant soul realizes that his justification comes because Christ, as his substitute and surety, has died for him as his atonement and righteousness. Friends, this is a glorious transaction. We should praise God. His praise should always be upon our lips. Christ has spoken the word only, and in the dark and void of man's life there is righteousness to everyone who will receive it. Some people believe that God will forgive sin, but it's hard for them to believe that he can keep them from the power of sin. They have yet to learn what is meant by God forgiving sins. They may have a measure of peace in believing that God has forgiven or does forgive their sins, but through a failure to grasp the power of forgiveness, they deprive themselves of much blessing that they might enjoy. I'd like to share a letter with you that was written by a man in great distress in 1902 to A.T. Jones. Listen to his words. Uh, this, this letter really touched my soul because I feel as though I wrote this letter. It says, I venture to approach you as my friend, and as I am in great trouble, I have taken the liberty of asking you to help me. During the past few months, I have given way to a black sin that is slowly but surely dragging me down away from the Savior. I am a Sunday school teacher and Christian worker and have known what it is to enjoy fellowship with God. But at the time of writing, I feel the worst of sinners. Will you tell me how to overcome? First, please note these facts. Every time I am tempted, I yield. And soon after, I am filled with sorrow. I go on my knees and implore God's forgiveness. I realize that he has forgiven me, and I promise him that I will never do it again. But alas, after a few days, the temptation comes again. And again I yield, and so I go on. I've prayed and prayed, but I really cannot resist, much as I wish to do so. For I may tell you that I detest myself for the shameful way I treat my dear Savior. It seems no use making resolutions, no use asking God's help. Oh, do tell now what I am to do. I feel like giving up altogether. But no, I cannot do that. I must conquer. I cannot, dare not, go on in such a life of sin and misery. It is impossible to remove the cause of temptation. What I want to know is, when I am greatly tempted, how may I stand and conquer? Please help me. I do so want to be a real Christian. Yours in great distress. This man knew the fact of forgiveness, but he didn't know the power. This man was trusting in himself rather than in the Lord. And I can really relate to this man's situation. This is what I was going through, and it, it brings great darkness and discouragement upon the soul. And this morning, or right now, I'd like to share a story in the Bible. Many, there are many stories in the Bible that illustrate the power of forgiveness, but I would like to look at one in particular right now. And it is found in Mark chapter 2, 1 to 12. Mark chapter 2, 1 to 12. And it says, and he again, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straight me, straightway many were gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. 
but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Uh, the opening scene of this story is told a little differently in Luke 5, 17. Luke 5, 17. It says, And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every nation of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them all. While Jesus was teaching, a man is let down from the roof into his presence. Friends, the sight of this man was so pitiful. He had been reduced to utter helplessness by the incurable disease of palsy. What a picture of humanity, the, humanity this is, reduced to utter helplessness by the incurable disease of sin. Before coming to Jesus, this man had presented his case to the Pharisees and doctors, those who should have cared about his soul, hoping that they would do something to relieve his tortured mind and physical suffering, but they just treated him coldly and told him he was incurable. The distress of his mind was only intensified when they told him that all his suffering was the righteous retribution of God for his life of sin. And he was led to believe that his affliction and distress was evidence of God's anger towards the transgressor. Having given up all hope of recovery, he sank down into despair. But hope revived in his soul when hearing that Jesus could help him and that he turned none away. But again, his hopes sank as he reflected that dissipation had been the main cause of his affliction and that he would not be tolerated in the presence of the pure physician. Oh, if he could just have relief from his burdened soul, the burden of sin which is his, in which his physical suffering paled into insignificance. The sin-bearer is alive to all the horrors which sin brings upon the soul. Knowing the longing of that man's burdened soul, Jesus first heals his diseased mind. How is it with you today? Do you need healing of your mind? Praise God, the mighty deliverer is here to set you free. In Matthew 9, 2, Jesus says, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. O oh, friends, the power of forgiveness. He was set free from the power of Satan by a word. These were the most precious words that could fall upon the ear of that sick sufferer, for the burden of sin had lain so heavily upon him that he could not find the least relief. Christ lifts the, bur lifts the burden that so heavily oppressed him. Be of good cheer. I, your Savior, came to forgive sins. Hope takes the place of despair and joy of oppressive gloom. The man's physical pain is gone, and his whole being is transformed. Making no further request, he lay in peaceful silence, too happy for words. At that very moment, by faith in the word of the Lord, he was made righteous, and therefore he had peace with God through his precious Savior. And those words were not just spoken to him that day. They echo down to our day. They're speaking to us right now. In his word, Christ communicates to us his grace and power. And this is such a precious promise. It says, you have confessed your sins and in heart put them away. You've resolved to give yourself to God. Now go to him and ask that he will wash away your sins and give you a new heart. Then believe that he does this because he's promised. This is the lesson which Jesus taught while he was on earth, that the gift which God promises, promises us we must believe we do receive, and it is ours. Jesus healed the people of their diseases when they had faith in his power. He helped them in the things which they could see, thus inspiring them with confidence in him concerning things which they could not see leading them to believe in his power to forgive sins.
Now, of course, there were doubters there that day, as there always will be, who didn't believe that Jesus had the power to forgive sins. There was no power for them, even though the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And Jesus, knowing their hearts, said, Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. Which is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or arise, take up thy bed, and walk? Both are difficult, and both require creative power. It was by the word and the word of God alone that Christ both forgave and healed that man. The power of forgiveness was in the fact that the man got up and walked. Do you think that that man went home slumped over because of the sins that he had committed in his life? No. He went home a changed man because of the power of forgiveness. The power of the life of Christ was now working in him. That same power is available to us right now. The Lord is saying, My child, thy sins be forgiven thee. Get up and walk. And when God forgives our sin, that forgiveness is the power by which we resist in the future. The life that cleanses from sin abides with us to withstand it. We are truly saved by Christ's life. And by his spirit working in us, he gives us power to obey. The Lord is the one that is faithful. And by his faithfulness working in us, each one of us can be saved. Hope in his word, trust in his power to save to the uttermost. Many pass long years in darkness and doubt because they do not feel as they desire. But feeling has nothing to do with faith. That faith which works by love and purifies the soul is not a matter of impulse. It ventures out upon the promises of God, firmly believing that what he has said he is able to also perform. Our souls may be trained to believe, taught to rely upon the word of God. That word declares that the just shall live by faith, not by feeling. Let us put away everything like distrust and want of faith in Jesus. Let us commence a life of simple, childlike trust, not relying upon feeling, but upon faith. Do not dishonor Jesus by doubting his precious promises. He wants us to believe in him with unwavering faith. And this, this experience right here in this little quote from Our High Calling is what I was going through. I was trusting in my feelings, and the more I trusted in my feelings, the darker and darker it got. And the more hopeless my, my condition felt. But as God started to teach me how to look to his word and trust in his word and trust in, the, in Jesus, he starts bringing me out of the darkness. And I pray that if you're going through the same experience, that he will bring you out as well through his precious word. And let us keep in mind that the sins that Christ overcame were our sins and that he really did overcome them. When strong temptations come, our victory is in recognizing that it has already been overcome. In the face of temptation, we can say, in 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And 2 Corinthians 2, 14 says, Thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. And Galatians 2, 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice the expression, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It doesn't say we're living by faith in our feelings. We live by the faith of the Son of God. The, fact, the faith that Jesus Christ had in the Father when he lived on earth, by which he resisted sin in the flesh, is given to you and to me for the same purpose in our flesh. As Jesus told the man to arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way, he is saying to us today, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Take him at his all-powerful word, and believe that his word will do just what it says. It is a glorious thing to know that even the weakness of our flesh 
are through Christ made stepping stones to infinite power. For we are told, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, instead of losing heart, we can say, Most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Friends, I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. I pray that it has been truly a healing balm. I pray that this message will help you to go on conquering and to conquer. Let us have a word of prayer. Precious Father, we just humbly bow before your throne of grace again, praising you and thanking you for your all-powerful word. We thank you, Father, that, that by the by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He spake and it was, he commanded and it stood fast. And that same word is the same word that will deliver us from the guilt and power of sin. And we just want to thank you so much, Lord, for sending your precious son Jesus to die for us. I pray that if there is someone out there that's listening to this message and has gone through a, a similar or is going through a similar dark experience, that, that Lord, you would help them to look up Help them to look and live. Help them to put their faith in Christ and in your word and your word alone. Help them to not trust in their feelings, Father. Help them to not look inwardly, but, but to look up. For your word says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And Father, I just, I just pray that you will bless us and keep us in your loving care, that you will strengthen us and guide us. And, and Father, I just pray that you would continue to fill our hearts with a greater love for you and a greater love for your word. Please bless us now as we go our separate ways and keep us, for we cannot keep ourselves. We thank you and praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen.